Star Wars The Clone Wars Season 2 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including this season. I will probably be talking fast because my back hurts. I am getting treatment later today, so I figured it was better to record it before the treatment rather than after. So, starting with the first season of the... The first episode of the season, here we go. Holocron Heist. So, yeah, after the episode starts with them trapped on the planet, the Jedi and the clones are able to say, Bye, Felucia. More Cad Bane. Awesome. Love it. I appreciate that this episode actually uses the Changeling powers, unlike Attack of the Clones. And Cad Bane, Toto, and Leto the Two Jedi make their way through the Snipes, De Niro, the Fan. I can't do this without a diaphragm. Do I have to draw you a diaphragm? Poor Toto. Only found out about the bomb moments before it killed him. That was very... That was... Um, Philip K. D. The... the um, actually, yeah. If I tell you which story of his, then that'll be a spoiler. But yeah. That really... Someone writing this episode, or producer or something on this episode, had read Philip K. D. and... I'm here for it. Let's see. And we're told what's on the Kyber. No wonder the Emperor wants it. And that brings us to the second episode, Cargo of Doom. You can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. In this episode, we see that evil tortures and carelessly kills. Very clever walking on the ship with the, well, walkers. I want my money, Bane, for the money train, or possibly the money plane. The zero gravity scene is very cool, a very clever of Cad Bane. I really like the escalation of a bomb going off. I don't love that it's done with slapstick. I do really appreciate that at the end of the episode, all of the bombs go off, so we have set up and pay off. Ahsoka's like, you don't impress me much. The ship is tearing itself apart, Lisa! And Cad Bane gets Anakin to do what he wants by threatening Ahsoka Tano. And the next episode is Children of the Force. I continue to really love Cad Bane. I work alone. My shadow's the only one that works beside me. And the scenes on Mustafar are cool. Well, hot. Next episode, Senate Spy. This was the most frustrating episode for me so far. The writing for Padme borders on character assassination. First, she's upset with Anakin for putting the war ahead of the two of them spending time together. When in Attack of the Clones, she is specifically choosing a relationship with him, even though she knows that their respective jobs will put a strain on that. He's an important general. She's a senator. You know, they spend a lot of their shared screen time bickering like an old married couple. At least she does go on the mission. It's only Anakin who thinks that she shouldn't. She doesn't even hesitate to go on the mission. I realized that kind of thing was prominent in movies from the age that inspired the original Star Wars trilogy and a number of things in the prequel movies, but while I do have issues with how gender-specific bordering on sex is Padme's written in the first two prequels and how bad it gets in Revenge of the Sith, which I won't spoil here, it was rarely this bad. Anakin is jealous of Clovis risking ruining the operation on multiple occasions, and at the end he leaves him with the people who knows he betrayed them. An argument could be made that he deserves it for working with a separatist, although obviously whether a spy is a hero or a traitor is a matter of perspective, as Black Arrow go goes forth so eloquently points out. However, it seemed to me more like Anakin was leaving Clovis behind because of his own because of Anakin's own jealousy. And Clovis is basically an evil banker, which is a very anti-Semitic trope. I realize that anti-Semitism was not on the rise when this season originally aired, but it has been a problem in America for many decades. I do appreciate that apparently Clovis does love Padme, and even when he knows she has betrayed him, he worries about her, not at first himself. Although, um, Shifrilla's Productions points out he's kind of simping for her, which is true. Now, that brings us to episode 5, Landing at Point Rain. I like seeing Geonosis, and again, at the very end of the episode, Obi-Wan challenges Anakin and Sokotano, counting kills, like it's some sort of video game. To quote Derek Grease, I would say that I approve, but right after Kiadi Mundi joins in. So that was, yeah... You know, it, it's it's awkward how the, the show, every so often it'll be like, war is... Terrible. War is the H word. But then sometimes, ah, oh, counting kills. That's fun. Even Kiadi Mundi is is joining in. You know, 
And that brings us to episode 6, Weapons Factory. At the start of the episode, Anakin basically mansplains the briefing to Ahsoka Tano, although they make it more of a rank thing than a gender thing. And But, but yeah, I do appreciate, you know, clearly the episode realizes that she deserves more respect. Tense when the group is surrounded and when the two Jedi are discovered planting bombs. I swear, this episode is like 30% Jedi planting bombs. I appreciate that at the end of the episode, Anakin does show more respect to towards Ahsoka. And next episode, Legacy of Terror. I really love that this episode and the next are basically horror, like zombie Gian Oceans, very aliens. I love the hive and the queen. And the queen is talking and Obi-Wan says submit and she yawns. And but but yeah, I I really love how episodic this sometimes gets with just one-offs or arcs that you can't see them building an entire show around. I, I don't necessarily want an entire multi-season show of just, just, you know, Star Wars with zombies. But it's great for a couple of episodes. Now, the next episode... Uh, right, yes. I... Let's see... Uh, right, I already really loved the development that Undula was going to be controlled by the worm in the previous episode, which ended up not happening, but then here we are, an entire episode where a bunch of clones are controlled by worms. Very creepy when the clones set up in unison, tons of creepy moments in this episode. I wish Anakin was not able to get credible intel from strangling uh, Poggle, as I discussed in my video on the first season. This is yet another post-9-11 piece of American media that makes excuses for torture. This despite the fact that in real life there is no credible evidence that torture gets credible intel. Incredibly tense when Ahsoka fights bears, and since we don't know if they survive the show, we watch terrified that one of them might actually die. You know, even... And, and that that would be horrifying for the other one, you know. I'm glad they didn't spend forever before revealing that Ahsoka Tano cut the worm, not Barris, since it's pretty obvious if your age is in the double digits, they were not going to have Ahsoka Tano kill Barris when the worm is the problem and right there available for her to kill. So, yeah. Episode 9, Grievous Intrigue. Is it murder if I kill Jedi? Yes, it absolutely is. I'm glad we were able to clear this up. In this episode, Grievous really is a Saturday morning cartoon villain, but I quite enjoyed it. We have no intelligence. Great rescue mission, really enjoyed the episode overall, but I did feel there was too much slapstick with the droid tor trying to torture or execute Master Koth. I quite like Galia. She's clearly coded as an African-American woman. She isn't stereotyped as being overly emotional and aggressive, as so many black women in American media unfairly are. Let's see. Anakin, you'll have to take care of the space battle. Obi-Wan will go down to the planet. That way, there's no way for Anakin to encounter Grievous. Let's see. Before Return of the Sith. Episode 10, The Deserter. The battle droids are running out of power. It's true what they say. An army ma marches on its battery. I think this is one of my favorite uh, episodes this season. It's not quite as entertaining to me as the Mind Controlling Worms ones, but I really appreciate the debate of free free will versus programming between Rex and Cut. And that brings us to Lightsaber Lost. I really love that Master Sinube is a lot like Ben Kenobi. Like, we've gotten used to Jedi running into danger with the prequels, but in the original trilogy, Ben is patient and doesn't rush. He tries to find non-violent solutions whenever he can. Like, I, I just rewatched um, A New Hope, you know, and, like, he almost never ignites his lightsaber. He almost never actually uses violence. He's always using trickery. And, yeah, here we have the this more patient Jedi, so, so, yeah. I like when he went all Sherlock on the root poisoner. The ending chase, especially the train portion, was incredibly tense and suspenseful. Absolutely loved it. Right, and, uh, yeah, I loved every episode, you know, every episode of the show so far, of, of these first two seasons. The Mandalore plot arc begins... Oh no, a PG bomb! Those innocent people were hitting the wall. 
I'm really glad Satine got to take part in the action. She may not be a fighter who can take down Mandalorians, but without her, Obi-Wan would have died in the machine. And I love that we see exactly what the machine does to the rock so we can clearly tell what it would do to Obi-Wan. Like, it's a simple, it's, it's you know, it's, it's trying to, it works. It's very cliche, but I do enjoy the radio double speech that she's able to respond to Obi-Wan in a way to, that to the governor sounds like she's talking to him. Uh, yeah, it was great to, uh, I, I'm blanking on his name, um, but I know exactly what he directed, so I'll really quickly have it. John Favreau, it was, it was cool that he voiced one of the, was it Vizsla something? Pre-Vizsla, maybe. I didn't write down all the names. It was, it was cool that he did, but like Shifrilla also pointed out, it was a little, like, surprising. He has a very distinct voice, but... Yeah, I, you know, I'm not going to claim, I'm, I'll probably never watch the, the Lion King remake. I'm not going to claim that everything he touches turns to gold, but he is responsible for some excellent Star Wars and MCU, so I am quite a fan of his. Let's see, great settings in this episode, the factory, the cliffside, very cool fight between the lightsaber and the darksaber. And very cool to be introduced to the Dark Saber. I've heard that it's important, but I haven't watched, yeah, past this yet, past this season yet. Episode thirteen, Voyage of Temptation. Obi Wan is like, I knew her, and Anakin is bucking him. Annie, go know yourself. And Satine is all like, so sick of his pack and parabellum, huh, Obi? Love to see more horror in Star Wars. There's always been at least a smidgen of it. Clones are picked off one by one. Very the thing. Or Alien, if you want to go with the lesser of the two movies. We were living hand to mouth. Yeah, I'll bet you were. The lift. I mean, elevator. Sometimes I forget that it's... They usually call it lift in Star Wars. And otherwise, like... When do you hear American... You know, actors say the word lift instead of elevator. Anyway, the character in First Satine is sexist like that of Padme in Episode 4. To these writers, even when in danger, these women care about their romantic feelings while the men manage to focus on the danger. And when the men bring up the possibility of straight romance to other men, it's to be annoying. Very stereotypical gender roles. They could have easily have, ha have the men focus on the romance as well and be accepting when, it's, uh, when bringing it up to each other. Uh, focusing focus a lot on the romance. I realize he does focus some on it. And one of the four senators is the traitor, and just like the thing, we have a you know it's not quite a blood test since this is a you know I'm I'm guessing PG or PG thirteen. They can't show actual blood pr pretty much, but yeah, a blood test equivalent, and it goes south. Holy crap! The baby spiders are terrifying and very the thing. And yes, I realize those two notes were chronologically out of order. And Anakin executes the traitor rather than Obi-Wan or Satine, which feels like a cop-out. We already know that Anakin is on the way to becoming evil. I, I don't know, I just feel like that was... Yeah, it would have been more interesting if it was one of the others. You know, he, as he pointed out, it would make them hypocrites. Episode 14, Duchess of Mandalore. The Emperor wants to occupy the world of a supposed ally, which, again, very, like, you know, how many military bases has America built around the world? And Obi-Wan is like, only fools rush in, and Satine is like, from a certain point of view. The Emperor refuses for the cops to assist Satine, and since he is a powerful person who does not want her to get help, she isn't granted it, which, again, very realistic, sadly. I gotta say, it's kind of looking like Satine is written as letting her emotions control her, which is another frustrating sexist trope. She does get better in this episode, uh, after this part. Yeah, Satine's f Satine flees the cops, even fights back as non-violently as she can, rather than stay and explain. This can help communicate to the audience. Sometimes this is necessary, and considering police brutality, that is sadly true. I, f I feel like this episode could help, you know kids and, and young people in general empathize more with victims of police brutality. There's so much copaganda in American media. The chair recognizes Senator Padme. Well, you pass your eye exam. I appreciate that the conflict of... Let's 
see. Yeah, the conflict of the <clears throat> episode is resolved by bringing evidence to light, not violence. I do worry a little and it might trick American children into trusting the American political system more than they should, since sadly evidence does not dictate policy currently. But there is a chance that what they might take away from it is that that is how it should work, which is, of course, true. So they'll be more attuned to noticing when it doesn't. But, but yeah, you know, Satine deciding to, to run away from the cops and fight back nonviolently, that's not her operating on emotion. That's her, you know, correctly assessing the situation. So I appreciate that. And Senate Murders, episode 15. I love this episode criticizing military spending and pointing out that war profiteers like the Kaminoan senator who has political power purely to make money off war will weaponize words. Did not mean for all that alliteration, accusing those who suggest we lower the budget of being on the side of the military. Enemy, I forget who, but someone said it was unpatriotic to be against the military in this episode, which is the kind of thing they said about Americans who were against the wars in the Middle East. And, yeah, this episode is a political assassination murder mystery. Absolutely love it. You know, there's there's been political assassination attempt. No, yeah, yeah, I guess political assassination. There's been some in, in Star Wars before, but, like, focusing an episode on a political assassination and having it play out as a murder mystery, yeah. I think they pushed too far, making the inspector irritating. The episode before this one also criticized the police, but did it without being really obnoxious. I gotta say, the moment that Lolo said that the inspector would get them all killed by assembling them in one room, I immediately figured, okay, she must be the real killer. But she did do a great frame job using Camino poison and all. Y yeah, you know, I... Uh, and it, it wasn't like I was annoyed until the reveal. And the reveal... The real reveal itself came pretty quickly after that, so... That brings us to episode 16, Cat and mouse love the design of the spider general super creepy just so gnarly and nasty just absolutely yes positively love it and the, they are really pushing like that's there's you know i i feel like this show i wouldn't show there are certain episodes of the show that i would not show to someone whose age was not at least a little bit in the double digits like this this is the kind of stuff that could cause nightmares for like you know some children watching the the yeah and it can fly a ship that is truly invisible to the naked eye i call the f-35 i love the submarine feel of this episode you would need actual cloaking technology in order to achieve that kind of thing in space help us obi-wan kenobi you're our only hope and that brings us to episode 17, Bounty Hunters. No wonder this one opens with an immemorian Akira Kurosawa. It's Seven Samurai, like that one episode of The Mandalorian also was. Absolutely love it. Akira Kurosawa has always been a huge influence on the, the yeah, Star Wars. I like the reveal that the alien in the robo suit is tiny. It really reminded me of the first Men in Black movie. And he was cool, both in and out of the suit. I, I quite like that, you know, you don't have to look tough to be tough. Enbo is a complete badass, really loved when he took out the scout. I like that at the end of this episode, we see that the bounty hunters now respect the Jedi. And that brings us to the Zillow Beast, episode 18. So the EMP bomb releases a kaiju. I haven't watched that many kaiju movies, but I've heard, you know, in some of them, it's a nuke. And I'm not surprised they didn't put a nuke in a Saturday morning cartoon. So this planet has the Doug species, like Sid Bulba, did not expect to sympathize with them, considering the Phantom Menace. Mace Windu wants to protect the life form. absolutely love it. I really appreciate how inhumane the Doug method is shown to be. I can imagine a lot of kids walked away from this episode caring more about the well-being of animals, and it does make sense for Jedi. I, uh, Shafrilla said, oh, but, you know, usually Mace, uh, they, yeah, they say Mace doesn't care about life because he killed... Django, I mean, that was, if if he didn't, I guess, potentially, he could maybe have tried to take him prisoner, but, you know, Django was a significant danger, it was a battle, it wasn't like a one-on-one -on -one kind of situation, you know, like, the, the more time Mace spends, you know, not killing the person he's fighting, 
you know, the bigger the chance gets that someone is going to shoot him in the back or something. So, yeah. And and the also do keep in mind, like, Django, you know, okay, he's he's a bounty hunter by trade. He could take those skills elsewhere. You know, he, he doesn't have to be a bounty hunter. The Zillow Beast, it did nothing to anyone until the bomb, like, uh, uh, unburied it. You know, when it was just down there... It was not hurting anyone, so, yeah, it didn't have a choice. You know, of course it's going to fight back when it's being attacked. What do you mean, stop? Cease. No more. The opposite of go. The episode ends with the Zillow Beast being taken to Coruscant, so somewhat like King Kong, absolutely love it. And... Yeah, the episode after is possibly even better. The Zillow Beast strikes back. Love seeing more Zillow Beast. The experimentation on it is cruel and the scientist is bothered by it. The greater good. It may be intelligent. Very true. And and actually, like, legit, it understands the... the yeah, it, it understands that the, the... You know, it might not be able to speak Galactic Basic... Maybe it doesn't understand every single word, but it definitely understood that the Emperor was telling it, or yeah, Palpatine at this point, was saying this, this horrible thing about it. And it spends the rest of the episode trying to, you know, focusing specifically on him. So that's, that's really great. Absolutely loved this. Yeah. You know, th that's actually noteworthy. Like, the only... We, we don't see very many characters be, like, in intentionally cruel to it one of the only ones we see is the one that we know becomes the emperor and yeah the episode title references the star wars movie empire strikes back which was already a reference to old time sci-fi titles so the attempt to kill the zillow fails it breaks free we have a kaiju attacking a major city climbing high up grabbing at least one person that it was close to earlier and feels something about and it's acknowledged that it's sad that it died. All of those are kaiju movie tropes, and I am here for it. Ah, Anakin has located the beginning of the fun. And Palpy wants it cloned, which I think is also a kaiju movie trope. I, Like I said, I don't have a lot of experience with them, but... Yeah. I, I, I love when someone... You know, decides to put something that they love into an episode of something that they're working on. So, that brings us to Death Trap. And, let's see, so yeah, episode 20. Baby Boba Fett, he does an incredible job shooting the guns. As we know, he has experience. And he, you know, honestly, I think he did a, a, a good job. I, I don't think his acting was excellent in the movie, but no one is, you know. But, but yeah, uh, uh, right, for those who might not know, I want to say his name is Daniel Logan, who also played Baby Boba Fett in Attack of the Clones, is the one voicing all of the, the child kid. I gotta say, it, it made me a little bit uncomfortable. I know, it's canon. I realize it was in Attack of the Clones, but they're basically, like, being groomed for war since childhood? I don't know. I feel like that might be a... Good idea to not dwell on, but, you know, it made for a cool episode, so I'll allow it. And he sets up a laser-activated mine. Windu is moments away from activating it. Instead, a clone activates it. This was no boating accident. And Boba carries out sabotage and even shoots the, the you know, You're not my brother. I'm not sure why, but I found this episode really gripping. Just the, yeah, I, I guess this thing of, like, he's... You know, he's becoming so so destructive because of his urge for revenge when really, you know, it's not like, yeah, now that I've watched the entire three episode arc, I can say there's no, like, he's not accomplishing anything. You know, it's not. So, so yeah, again, good message for the youngins. Revenge is a self-destructive, you know, there used to be that, you know, if you dig a grave for another man, make sure you dig in one for yourself, something like that, you know. You know, revenge, there's a lot of American media that just really loves revenge and prevents it, pre presents it as this cathartic thing, which is not real. That's not how it feels in reality, and I do not speak from experience, but I have 
looked at studies. You must abandon ship. No, you must abandon ship. Nuh uh. Yaha. And. Do you like that? That I went from something kind of intellectual and analytical to such a. such a ridiculous joke? But seriously, watch the, the exchange and tell me that you don't see what I'm. That, that there's a little bit of that there. Anyway, R2 come home. So. R2 is special. He can spend an entire trilogy using flight and another never using it. I quite like when R2 fought to protect R8. Solidarity. And yeah, here we see Boba get very self-destructive, risking himself to confirm the kill. You know, he started down that path. Like, he could easily have died in the, in the ship. You know, and, and he's, like, risking killing a lot of people. Just to, to get this one person. Let's see. Very cool to see Gundarks. I really like when R2 sent one of them flying. and we, Which is also great, because, like, until that point, it's been kind of... The, the Gundarks are kind of scary, you know, certainly for, for kids, they must be. And then we get this, you know, relief of the tension when one of them is reduced to, like, this, this joke. It's, you know, essentially, like, almost a slapstick joke. And at the end, Mace finally trusts and appreciates R2... I also really appreciate, like, R2 had to go through a lot that, like, in order to actually get to, you know, yeah, they, they managed, it, it took a lot to, to get, and it, yeah, actually, I guess there's a little bit of payoff for the, um, what's it called, you know, we, we know that Boba is a really great shot, but now we're told, well, you can't shoot both of them. So he has to shoot one of the rings, and R2 goes for the other one. Final episode of the season, Lethal Trackdown. So, let's see. Yeah, so uh, I made a list of some issues that I have with the prequels that are not in the original trilogy. Like, you know, Lucas's bad dialogue is in both of them, but the original trilogy is still, well, A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back are still excellent. And let's see. So, yeah, uh, one of the things that I dislike about the prequels, the war is meaningless because Palpatine wins regardless. Yeah, you know, here we get these personal relationships. It, it, so far, the, the show, this show has done a good job of focusing on the personal since, you know, the war, the overall war is ultimately meaningless, sadly. But, yeah, focusing on the personal. And, you know, I, I criticized the, the Satine and, and thing, you know, I don't. I don't hate the idea that Obi-Wan was, you know, that yeah, that they were in love with each other. And, you know, they couldn't, they would have to abandon what they were in order to be together. You know, es essentially it is a, it's, it's Obi-Wan faced the same uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, it's the same thing as with Padme and Anakin, only Obi-Wan and Satine made the, the better choice, you know, so... Yeah, I appreciate, you know, it is, because let's be honest, like, a lot of people, there, there's this idea in a lot of popular media that, like, you should spend the rest of your life with the per first person you fall in love with, and just realistically, that's not, like, you know, I, I feel like I've heard about a couple of cases where it's worked out, but... For a lot of people, it's not going to work out, you know, it's not a good idea, like, long-term relationships kind of need emotional maturity and you know a lot of people don't have emotional maturity the very first time they fall in love with someone so yeah i i appreciate that and i do you know wasn't a big fan of the the you know the bickering between anakin and padme but i do really appreciate that padme you know like she doesn't even hesitate she's like no this is my job i'm i'm you know i'm the person who can take care of the spy situation, I'm gonna do it, so, you know, let's see, uh, the shift from, of Anakin from good to evil is too abrupt, keeps going back and forth, I mean, I feel like they, they did, uh, they, they did okay on, in, in this, you know, there's, there's a couple of times where he goes dark side, let's see, um, or, right, and, yeah, like with season one, you know, in, in Return of the Sith, I can't tell who's winning in the battle scenes. But in the, you know, 
yeah, so far in these two seasons, I, I can always tell. And, the, yeah, why did the Jedis lose? They are so ridiculously powerful. That is still worse in this show than it was in the in the prequels. See, again, like, if you only watch the original trilogy, notice how much smaller the, the stuff that the Jedi can do. Like, the, the, the stuff that's really powerful is they can get information very, very effective, you know, um... But when when you actually look at, like, force power use in, like, combat and such, it's way smaller than the prequels. So, in the original trilogy, I, f I felt like it makes much more sense that someone was able to... Because we were told, you know, what was it, for a thousand years or a thousand generations, I forget. And I think George Lucas did at least once as well. The the Jedi protected the, were, were protectors of the peace, some, something like that, you know. I, I could believe that they could eventually lose, given the way that the Force works in the original trilogy, but the prequels, and especially this show, where, like, no one... It's... it's uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, so, prequel... Uh, in the prequels, I feel too little emotional engagement. I feel a lot of uh, emotional engagement in this show. The movies are too busy visually. That's not the case in the show. And let's see... Right, so, I like the Bounty Hunter stuff. Calling the season Rise of the Bounty Hunters, you would expect more... I, I, is there more than, like, four or five episodes? Maybe they needed more yeast. Anyway, that brings us to the ranking. So, ranked worst to best, keeping in mind I love both. You know, they, they are both amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love both. The overall season, ranked worst to best, season one and season two. And the finale is also... It, yeah, honestly, the overall season, the, f the the season finale, the season opener, for all of them, I think season two is better than season one. And that's no small feat. Because the it's their, their shoes are very large, in fact. Big shoes to fill. I really did love... like I don't love the movie, but the very first episode of the, the show itself with Yoda, you know using guerrilla tactics to, to get out of, you know, I forget, was it maybe Ventress who was setting up a trap, you know, really loved that, but then, let's see, what was, what was the first, season? right, Holocron Heist, that was even better, and let's see, season one, yeah, I'll real quick, season one's finale, oh, right, because I have the notes on paper, I don't have them right, um, let's see if I get the names of the season, and that I can find very quickly, so. The, let's see, here we go. And if I click, there we go. Hostage Crisis, yes, that was also an excellent episode. So, yeah, but, you know, this season, uh, Lethal Trackdown was even better, so, yeah, absolutely yeah, they did a really amazing job here. And let's see. Um, yeah, so let's see. Some critic quotes. Uh, you know that the villains aren't going to get their comeuppance since they're still active later in the storyline, so you're left with a show about some people doing stuff. Yeah, I, I wouldn't... I, I liked the season a lot better than, than this guy, but yeah. Let's see. Um, exciting, cool, funny, and it's getting even better. And lots of stories about almost all the characters of the Clone Wars. Absolutely agreed. I, I really appreciate that. Obviously, they couldn't provide a lot of characterization for everyone in the movies, but they, they could have made the wrong choice and focused this show entirely on the ones that we already know from the movies. I really appreciate that they didn't. And let's see. Yep, season 2 raises the bar. Literally everything is a notch above where it was. The character dialogue is slightly sharper. The clones themselves are more sympathetic. The music more epic. The connections to the oral saga... Uh, let's see, more tenuous. The CGI, well, still not all that good, is notably more polished. I'm not really sure in what way the CG has improved. It reminds me of test renders. Wow. 
Season 1 looked like a lot of it was test render footage, and this looks closer to final render. I mean, I guess it has improved. I, I wouldn't go as far as say it's test render footage in Season 1, but yeah. Let's see. And... Uh, let's see. In terms of content, it's still a mixed bag. The bad episodes aren't quite as bad as those in Season 1, and the good episodes are of a higher caliber than the highlights of Season 1 as well. The horror-themed trilogy of episodes mid-season is unquestionably the highlight, seamlessly fusing Star Wars with something like Alien. But there was also a moment in an early episode, maybe the first, where we truly see Dark Anakin as he goes to interrogate... A, yeah, you know, tortures the guy... And, yeah, this is the kind of thing I would find deplorable in real life, but for raising the dramatic stakes, as well as building on Anakin's overall character development during his priest's life, I cannot express how much I love this moment. And, let's see. Uh, right, some some people say that the, the, yeah, standout episodes are... Brain Invaders, Duchess of Mandalore, and the Zillow Beast. Those are definitely great. And... Let's see. The best episodes are the ones that show us the, the war and the consequences. And... Let's see... Familiar faces such as Boba Fett, Bosk, and Ara Singh are joined by new characters Cad Bane, Sugi, and the swashbuckling intergalactic pirate Hondo Onaka. Other new standouts include the diplomatic Duchess Satina Kriz. Yeah, I forget how you pronounce it. The vile Pre Vizsla and the monstrous Zillow Beast. And. <laughs> The second season two is a great improvement over the first one. Not only because annoying characters like Jar Jar or Zero the Hut never appear, though that is a plus, but because the action is more intense, the writing is a bit sharper, and it takes the characters in new directions, like giving Obi Wan a love interest. Let's see. Ahsoka is more grounded, less rebellious. Lightsaber laws, more a vignette with a pretty obvious message. Panders to a younger audience than most of the series seems to be targeting. I guess that is, there is an, there is some truth to that, yeah. And, let's see. Season two, nothing happened so extraordinary as to make one attached to the girl. That is, perhaps... Yeah, I, I, um, I don't have a, a huge issue with her. I, I don't think it was necessary. Uh, no, I think I'll, um, yeah, so far, I don't think that the, this, this thing of her, you know, not being patient and, and operating on her, you know, using her emotions, I don't think there's enough of a difference between her and Anakin himself, so I I don't. But but I'm looking forward to you know I. This is a character that is beloved by a lot of people, so I'm sure in one of the next seasons, I will, you know, understand why I don't mind her character. Let's see, and and you know I didn't really mind Zero either. Zero the Hut. Jar Jar, I mind. Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, the season is highly plot driven. Anakin's temper is annoyingly under control. His, his turn to the dark side less realistic. His interactions with Padme more stereotypically guy responses as opposed to those of a complex or realized character. And Senate spies seem more like a type than an actual vital story within the saga. Arcs like Boba Fett's return minimize the power of characters like Mace Windu, and that continues to cheapen the overall power of the Jedi. Let's see. Well, a lot of the first season dealt with the relationships between Anakin and Ahsoka this season broke them up multiple times, allowed them to have their own adventures. Ahsoka is a likable character. Yeah. And I've I enjoyed the little adventure she had with her fellow Padawan. I enjoyed the fact Anakin has to branch off and work with other Jedi instead of just Obi-Wan. Very true. And let's see. 
There's only so much a series can do with a pair of villains whose fate is already known. As far as I'm concerned, the decision to bench the big guns from time to time was a wise one. I agree. It, you know, I like Grievous whenever he isn't in a live-action movie, but so far, you know, but both the seasons of this so far and the entirety of Clone Wars, no, the, the, the original micro-series, it's called, on at least on Wikipedia, you know, he's a really cool character, but we do know what's going to happen, so it is, uh, yeah. And, let's see... It's clear the showrunners live, breathe, and bleed Star Wars so much so that they aren't interested in telling stories similar to those that have already been told. How many times can Anakin face Dooku, fight to a stalemate, walk away angry before the dance wears thin? How often can Anakin and Grievous narrowly miss bumping into each other before it feels contrived? And let's see. Which I still... I, I don't... I don't know that I really feel like this show needs to be in perfect continuity with the prequels. Like, there's stuff in the prequels that's, you know, that, that doesn't work well for the continuity of the original trilogy. So, yeah. Let's see. Um... It leads to some hit-or-miss storytelling. The highly anticipated Mandalorian arc is a bit stuffy for its own good. The overcrowded bounty hunters would have really benefited from 10 more minutes. That is true. Bounty Hunters is, yeah. Cad Bane and his flock, the thrust of the series' second season marketing campaign, disappear for the better part of 18 episodes. But it also keeps the Clone Wars and greater Star Wars methods from growing stale. Very true. Mandalorian arc too stuffy. I don't know that I agree with that, but I, yeah, there's maybe some truth to it. And let's see. See. Yeah, uh, some people did not like the Zillow Beast arc, and let's see. Yeah, you know, I I absolutely loved it, but yeah, you know, and and for sure, like it is something I understand you wouldn't really expect to see in Star Wars. You know, they've never done a straight up kaiju before this, these couple of episodes. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I guess maybe in Droids or some of the Ewok movies, I'm not. Or, or the Ewok animated show. Probably not going to be doing those. But, you know, yeah, they, they straight up, like, you could very, like, you could show these two episodes to someone who knows nothing about Star Wars and isn't even remotely interested in Star Wars, but who just really loves kaiju, and they would be like, you know what, that's a pretty decent representation of, of kaiju. Again, as far as I understand, I've, I've watched... I think I watched the Roland Emmerich Godzilla, which might clue you in as to why I haven't, you know, been in just... of, of an absolute rage trying to find every other Godzilla, because that movie is not great i'm not sure i have anything to say about it that like didn't didn't nostalgia critic back in the day do a pretty decent video on that i, f I feel like so you know but but yeah um and you know i have watched yeah i don't i don't know if it's super obvious but behind me that is king kong yeah i i i realize some of the you know i'll i'll briefly go through since it's the end of the video anyway so king kong 2005 Resident Evil Retribution, because, you know, so, so yeah, King Kong, because Kaiju, I, right, uh, I, I'm not sure he's technically a Kaiju, but there's a lot of similarity between King Kong movies and Kaiju movies, if, if King Kong movies aren't Kaiju movies, Res, Resident Evil Retribution, because of all the clones, and, you know, some of the clones clearly having, like, a humanity to them, they're not just, like, pre-programmed, Seven Samurai, uh, uh, crap, what's it called again? Seven, the Magnificent Seven, that's it, the original uh, one. 1982, The Thing, because of the, the similarity. To, so, so yeah, a couple of these are based on, you know, a couple of episodes of this season. THX 1138, since that is also George Lucas, 
and then we have Dark Forces to, uh, uh, yeah, Dark Forces 2. I can't believe I'm blanking on that. Hold on. Dark Forces 2, The Jedi Knight, I think it's called. Yeah. That, that I love the titling of, of that series. So it's Dark Forces, Dark Forces 2, Jedi Knight, Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast, and then just Jedi Academy. Anyway, like you can't even say, oh, but all of them have Dark or Forces or Jedi. And no, not quite. Anyway. Then you have uh, Lego Star Wars. It says the full, you know, the, the full saga, but it's that's because of when it came out. That was the full saga. It is all of the original trilogy, all of the prequel trilogy, nothing past that because it was released before any news. You know, they, they were pretty, probably like, we're never going to see another Star Wars movie, are we? Let's just put something out and call it the full saga. Anyway. Star Wars Battlefront, the original, and Star Wars Battlefront 2, the original. The, the, I believe they're from 2004 and 2005. Not the more recent ones, which I've heard. I mean, it's, it's like, it's EA, so I, I don't even really need to hear that much else. But I have heard a little bit else, a little, little bit other, you know, oh, you know, micro transact. Or wait, wait, was that the one where they finally, people fought back against my tra microtransactions, and then it went, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway. It is possible that I, I, th I think I got like a free version of one of the new Star Wars Battlefronts. So if at some point my body feels good enough to that I can sit down, play video games again, uh, yeah, I, I might play it. And you know, at that if that happens, I will almost definitely do a review. Um, anyway, yeah, really, really love this season. Um, it's it's so cool to be watching something that gets better as it goes. You know, that's something I've seen several reviewers point out, you know, very frequently. It's like, oh, wow, what an amazing first season. And then it's like, oh, okay, I guess they didn't really have a lot of other stuff to, you know. It just, you know, off the top of my head, like, Dexter, Heroes, Lost, uh, I feel, uh, uh, Prison Break, you know. I, I love all seasons of Prison Break, but I'm not going to claim that they're all equally, you know, I feel like there was probably more, like, near the end of Season 2, and then for some of Season 3 was, like, a step down. And certainly Season 2 was very different. Anyway, that is it. So I intend to do at least one more video this week. So maybe I'll catch you then. If not, I guess I'll see you in two weeks when I cover Season 3. So may the Force be with you. I just managed to... Finished the video, and then I realized I did not actually talk about my specific thoughts on the final episode. So, yeah, here those are. Love seeing Hondo again. And the, the you know, we see that this is a really bad place in part because you have these, I forget what they're called, but I think it's those annoying little things that, like, laugh when Jabba says something. But, yeah, they're fighting each other, so that's you know, yeah, that tells us that that's a really bad place, and, you know, on, on one hand, I feel like Ara would have been fine if she actually shot the, the guy before he got a chance to get the message out, but, wait, or was it, was she waiting for him to get the message out so that the Jedi would pick up on it and think that she didn't know that they were... Maybe that's the... You know what? Fair enough. That, that works. But, let's see. Many people have them. Lightsabers? Questions! And, you know, basically Aura is undone by you know, the the violence that she lives with and her selfishness. If she hadn't betrayed Boba. Let's see. And yeah, love seeing Bounty Hunter action. But but yeah, the the you know Ah, what's the word? If she if she lived a more honest life, she wouldn't you know, be in this you know, really awful situation and yeah, you know, and, and we do see, you know, it's, you know, in, in the Star Wars galaxy, it is possible to live an honest life. So, you know, we, we 
every so often meet farmers, there are senators, there's, you know, so, yeah. Anyway, that is it for this one. So, may the force be with you.